the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. The simple song just says, I will bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his Come on, everybody, let's bless his name. Hallelujah. Oh, I will bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me, bless. Sometimes we just got to worship the Lord for what he's done. Sometimes we got to get rid of the things that we know and come into something new. Bless the Lord. Come on, let's sing unto the Lord. Oh, my soul and all that is within me, bless. One more time, let's say I will bless, I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless you. Oh, hallelujah, bless his, bless his holy name. We're going to bless his name. Bless his holy Come on, let's worship God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What is the most, one of the most important characterizations 
of God's love? The answer is simply grace. Amen. Grace um, is action on God's part. It is motivated by love and it is shaped by holiness, which takes account of the seriousness of sin, yet brings sinners back into communion with him. Amen. Grace is God's action that despite the seriousness of our shortcomings or our sins, the, the actions that we uh, behave that separate us from God or that separated us from God, it takes account of the seriousness of it, which means he counts up the cost. He measures how heavy it is and how much damage sin does as it pertains to our relationship with him. And then he still chooses to bring us back in communion or fellowship with him. Grace is layered throughout scripture from Genesis to Revelation. It is found in the Old Testament as a form of special favor or preference from God to a particular person or people. It characterizes the manner in which he deals with those who through their rejection of him as their creator and sovereign being deserve nothing from him and yet whom he still chooses to bless. It characterizes him because in and we've heard it while we were yet sinners, while we were yet in our sin, while we were yet doing what it is with, that we decided to do on our own accord that we know whether we knew or didn't know that separated us from God. He still chose to bring us into a place where we can have a relationship with God. And so where am I talking about as, as it concerns um, a history of love? Amen. Any of us, we've, we've seen um, love movies. We've seen uh, movies that surround love. We've seen movies that uh, involve relationship. We've seen movies that involve two or three people or two or three people. Lord Jesus, I don't watch too many movies but that, that, have, <laughs> that have involved people who want to be in a relationship. And usually the biggest issue in said relationship or for the relationship to come together is usually the behavior of one or both parties. Amen. The relationship is usually uh, dealing with some form of damage because somebody isn't doing what is needed for the relationship to work. Amen. What am I saying? Sometimes that's distance. You live on, you know, we've seen movies with long distance relationships or we've been in long distance relationships where one person lives in one state and another person lives in another state or even countries. And because somebody refuses to come together, the relationship now has a strain and it cannot do what it's supposed to do because somebody, one or both parties, don't want to move closer to be together. Other movies will, will, will show uh, infidelity and other movies will show some type of disloyalty one to another. So what God is saying is and what Grace says is despite your behavior that keeps us separated, I'm still going to choose you. Amen. And so... As, as a loving God faced with the rebellion of his creation, which is truthfully the biggest reason why we are separated, it is because of our rebellion. It is because of our choosing, our lack thereof, choosing to do what he has instructed us to do. Amen. Rebellion started in the Garden of Eden. Amen. When God had, he created all creation, he created man, and he created woman, and he created everything that was in the garden. He said to them, you can have everything, that, anything that you want in this garden. But it's one thing that you cannot have. You cannot eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You, you cannot have it. You cannot eat it. You will not eat it. And we so we know the story. I'm just giving you a quick backstory, and we're going to go ahead and jump into this thing. And they ate of it. Amen. Rebellion instantly right there. Seeing we just chose not to do what God told us to do. And so now we have separation. And so um, we are his creation. So he's faced with the rebellion of this creation and he desires to bring he desires to bring us them back into communion with himself. Yet his holiness cannot simply allow their sin to pass without response. For if God allows our unholy rejection of him to stand, he is contradicting his own name. But why not? Here is the here in we have our message for today. Why not? Why 
does God fight so much to have us? Why does God want us who he created and then yet rebelled against him to be close to him? He is God. He can do whatever he wants and it is us that made the mistake. Anybody can say that they are the ones who made the mistake. Anybody can speak to themselves and say, I, I, it was me. Is that all right? A lot of times uh, I've learned in being married that sometimes you just got to say, no, it was me. I did it. You know, a lot of times when I first got married, I was like, no, 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 no. It's because of what you did. Or, no, 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 no. You made it. No, I did it. I did it. Anybody got anybody can just say I did it. You know, just go on and put your hand up, put your head down. You did it. It's because of you. And, and but that's how we're going to get over it. Right. And it is us that failed and fell short. And God could have simply allowed us to walk in our sins and wash his hands of us. He could have said, you know what? And he almost did. Amen. God could have simply said, you know what? I'm done with y'all. I don't, I don't really got, I don't really want to do this no more. I'm going to let you just go ahead and do you. And I'm going to let you fall short and you don't have to have anything to do with me. As a matter of fact, like I said, he almost did it. He went and we know the story of Noah. We, but we know it from the childlike perspective that it rained and it rained and it rained. And Noah had gathered all the animals two by two. And he, it was all, we know the cute version story of it. But what God was really saying was he was really, he was tired and he was hurting because man had continuously chosen time and time again. And they did not choose God. But then the Bible says that Noah found grace. If you go back and you look in Genesis, you will find that after God had it, it repented God and that it hurt him that he had created man. It said that Noah found grace. Here we go. Here we are at grace. And so um, why did he preserve Noah? Was Noah so good that he represented all of mankind? Was he so good that he was exactly what God wanted every single one of us to be. Was it just Noah? All the people in the world, and he only found favor with one man and his family. One person in the entire world was worthy of God's grace. And if you really, if you really want to get literal, that's literally what he did. But what Noah found was God's divine ability to uh, um, preserve all of mankind. Noah was that thing that God had hope in. And it was that somebody on this earth would choose me. And because Noah did, God decided to continue on the bloodline, not just of Noah, but of all mankind through his preferred and unmerited favor of Noah. Amen. Um, so here it is yet. He could allow us to remain lost. God could allow us to walk in our sin. God could allow us to remain separated, but he does not. And it is not for vain glory or for a proverbial applause. God did not keep mankind so that we could pat God on the back. He kept uh, God, he kept Noah, therefore he kept mankind with the ability to get it right because it is what he said of himself. See, we have to understand that God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. But God, because of what he has said of himself, has to honor his relationship with the cre creatures that he created. In Exodus 34, 6 and 7, Moses is in a cave. I'm, I'm going to get to our foundational scripture, but I'm just building us up right here. Moses is in a cave and God passes by. And as God passes by, Moses cannot look upon God, but he can look at his glory. Is that all right? And it changes uh, Moses' countenance in his face. And as he's looking, he hears the Lord say that he is six things. God says that he is compassionate. He is gracious. He is slow to anger. He is abounding in love. He is faithful and he is forgiving. Now, if you know anything about God is when God says something about himself, he has to be able, he has to express that. He has to make that known, not just in knowledge only, but by his own actions. 
So here we are dealing with grace. We are dealing with grace. We have grace because God said he was gracious. Amen. We as man, um, as a man, excuse me, I know that I am nothing if I can't keep my word. If I tell you I'm going to do something and I don't do it, I am therefore no longer useful to the person that I made the promise to. Amen. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter what I say. It, what matters is if I said I'm going to do something, I have to do it. All right. My wife holds me accountable to that every single day, because if I begin to look like it's not going to happen, she's going to remind me, you said you were going to do this and you said you were going to do that. And so what we have to remember is that God said he was gracious. Therefore, he has to be gracious. Amen. When dealing with God, much like any other relationship, it is important to understand that God expects you to be thankful for for the how. He expects you to be thankful for how he loves us. He, he expects us to be grateful for how he does what he does in our lives, but to be but 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 to be knowing and understanding of his why. There's a difference between being thankful for his how and understanding of his why. Amen. In the church, we say we praise God for what he does, but we worship him for who he is. Amen. And, and, and worshiping him for who he is requires that we know his why. So um, he needs his why to be explained and understood because it enhances our ability to worship him. Our understanding God's why, this is why we're talking about the why today, is because it is going to enhance our ability to worship him. It is impossible for you to fully worship God if you do not know why he does what he does. It is impossible for you to fully worship God if you do not understand or do not know why he does what he does. I know I can say right now, everybody stand to your feet and let's begin to worship God. And we will all stand and we will all clap our hands and we will all close our eyes and we will begin to speak nice things to God because that's what we have been taught to do. But worshiping goes a lot farther than clapping your hands, closing your eyes and screaming out a whole bunch of nice words. Worshiping God is literally being in relationship with God. It is being in communion with God. That's why he says, put no other gods before me and thou shalt have no other gods before me because we engage in relationships with other things more than we engage in relationship with God but really is because we don't understand him amen and 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 that's okay that we don't understand him right now that's what we come here for is that all right so so I gotta I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a real quick question and I don't want nobody to stand up I just want you to simply raise your hand and I want you to be truthful don't look to the left don't look to the right look straight at me and I want you to answer this question if you have heard of God raise your hand Raise it real high, right? I heard of God. I know the name God when they say I can recognize that. Okay, now I want you to raise your hand if you know what God has done for you on a regular basis. Amen. We got good, good, very good, very good. Now I want you to real. I want you to raise your hand if you know why God has did done what He's done. Fully understand why God did what He did. Yep. They start getting sporadic. They start getting, and that's. Great. Everybody is not supposed to understand. Everybody is everybody is not supposed to understand initially. That's what church is for, to help you begin to understand. Amen. The what? God loves, God forgives, God is patient, God is faithful. And then we'll deal with the why on today. So I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Luke. Once you turn your Bible to the book of Luke, we're going to go to the 15th chapter. Luke 15, and then we're going to go down to the 11th verse. Amen. Once you have it, please stand for the reading of God's word. Amen. The Bible reads, and he said, this is Jesus, a certain man had two sons. 
And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them, both sons, his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent himself into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he rose and he came to his father. But when he saw, but when he was, excuse me, when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But, somebody say but. The father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be married. For this was my son who was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The why. Amen. The why. We here are dealing with. Uh, the parable of the prodigal son. It's a very, it's one of um, the more famous uh, parables that Jesus ever taught. First of all, what is a parable? A parable is a simple story used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson. Jesus taught in parables. Amen. If you go and you read through the gospels, you will see tons of parables. You'll see the parable of the Good Samaritan, and you'll see the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin. There, parable after parable after parable after parable after parable. Amen. And so while Jesus was teaching about God and his desire to redeem the lost, he is he is speaking in response to to who scorned him for receiving known sinners. Amen. So Jesus is now in his ministry. He's walking about the earth. He has been baptized. He has been claimed. He has been proven to be the son of the living God. And now what he's dealing with and what he's doing is teaching. And uh, as he's teaching, um, he has naysayers. First and foremost, I want to say, I want to speak to this. I, I'm noticing this, and I notice this in, in, in people. There are going to be, uh, throughout your life, I'm speaking to everybody here, four types of people that will be in your life at the same time. You need all four of these people to be in your life at the same time to continue to help you grow. All right? So, Person number one is going to be the person that you pour into. This is the person that you mentor. This is the person that you are regularly encouraging. This person may or may not reciprocate this encouragement. What you put into them, they may not always be able to put out back into you, okay? So I don't want you to get upset because I'm always helping this person, but they are not able to help me. You need this person. Uh, person number two is the person that walks with you. Amen. These are people who are your equals. They have the same mental understanding. They have the say they're on the same spiritual level as you. These people keep you grounded. These people let you know that you're in the right place in this season in your life. Person number three is the person that begins to scorn or scoff at you. They always got something negative to say. They always throw in shade. It just never seemed like they got anything nice to say to you. They 
usually are never in your face. They always kind of hang to the back and you see them every now and again. And then person number four is the person that pours into you. This person is the person that is always encouraging you that you may not always be able to encourage, that you may not always be able to lift up and give a kind word to. So all four of these people build out and they are there for you. Amen. And so what we have to understand is if we are dealing with somebody and this is really I'm speaking really to person number one and person number three, because we like to cut off people who can't give us uh, what we given them. And we like to try to cut off uh, our haters. Is that all right? You cannot cut everybody out of your life. They are shaping you and molding you. Your haters are there to let you know that you're still moving up because they still complaining about the things that you are getting. So you are just a reminder to me that God is still blessing me. The Lord said that he will bless you at the he will bless you in front of your enemies so why is it that we are trying to kick our enemies to the curb when God is saying I'm going to bless you in front of them God cannot complete his work if he's not blessing you in front of your haters or your enemies amen so here we are I just had to give y'all that piece because I'm Jesus is responding to the Pharisees because Jesus is not on the earth he has performed miracles. He has um, provided who he is. He has gone and been baptized. He's doing everything the right way. He's doing what he's supposed to do, right? And yet somehow the minute that he begins to sit down with sinners to encourage them, he's being talked about. The, the, the Pharisees have now decided that they had something to say because Jesus was preaching to the sinners, and a lot of times we've heard the saying, we've heard the phrase, you are the company that you keep. Amen. And while that has a, a, a semblance of truth to it, uh, the believer isn't necessarily the company that we keep because the company that we're supposed to keep is the company that we are preaching to. We are supposed to be sitting down with those who are struggling in the faith because we are to be there to encourage them and to help bear their burden. Everybody, if you are a believer and if you are a child of God and all you want to be around is people who don't have problems, then you're missing the mark. You've got to find the people who have problems. You got to speak to those who are struggling and you got to begin to surround yourself with people that you can give the gospel to. Amen. If you're not giving the gospel, you're not doing the work. Amen. And so um, it, it, it is it is in Jesus's response that along with the parables concerning the lost coin and the lost sheep, he lands on this one. So if you got your Bible, and if you have a study Bible, this um, actually, if you even have a regular Bible and you go up all the way to the beginning of chapter 15, you will see that Jesus had taught on two parables right before he got to the prodigal son. Amen. Um, the two prior parables include a coin. The first one is about a coin that has no limbs. It's a coin, right? Coins don't have legs, arms, feet, and a head. It has no physical power, and it does not have the ability to be lost on its own accord. It's a coin. It just gets removed from its proper place. And Jesus explains in his parable about the lost coin that the owner is so determined to find it that he leaves the supervision of the coins that he has to find the one that he does not. The sheep, however, this is the second parable, does have a physical body. He has eyes, he has legs, um, and he even has a mind. But we, uh, we know sheep are not smart. Amen. If you've heard, if you've really done and studied the anatomy of sheep or the studied the thought process of sheep are what we consider dumb. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, the, the sheep are not very smart. And as they see, so they go. A sheep will see an open field and he'll just walk towards it. If a sheep is not led, he will, he will uh, go astray. Some sheep even drown because they are not great swimmers, but they love being by the water for whatever reason. Is that all right? It does not click to them that this is a place that I should not go. And this individual sheep in the parable has wandered off and is now lost. And like the shepherd, um, and the shepherd, like the owner of the coin, is again so diligent in finding the one that he has seemingly abandoned the post of watching the others. This is that's the story. The story says Jesus's point is that God will leave the ninety nine to find the one. Amen. And so both of these parables are similar in that that the owner of the coin and the shepherd of the sheep left the masses to go find the individual. 
And um, the shepherd, excuse me, I'm sorry. Surely, here we go. Jesus is not suggesting that God would abandon us who are in our right place to go adhere to those who are out of place. Rather, he is suggesting that God is so secure in us being where we are supposed to be that he can move to give the lost the attention that they are so desperately in need of simply because he loves them and he cares for them. Amen. That is the theme of the month is that God loves us so much that he is willing to let those who are in their right place. Okay, y'all sit right here. Y'all got kids. You got you got kids. You you know when you got one kid over there acting like they don't got no sense and you got the baby sitting over here. Okay, y'all sit right there. I'll go be right back and I got to go give the one who needs attention attention. Is that all right? If you work on a job, you see all of the co-workers who are doing what they're supposed to do, the boss don't have nothing to say to them. But that one who just seems like they can't get it right i gotta begin to come and give attention to how'd i get in here <laughs> and um and so what god is what jesus was teaching on was that god loves everybody so much that i'm just not gonna let you be over here alone and by yourself i'm going to come and find you so now we have the parable of subject uh, the story, this story revolves around a man with two sons, one that stayed in his proper place and one that had gotten lost. Unlike the coin, this second son had limbs and unlike the sheep, he had some semblance of intelligence. Amen. This one had the ability to make up his own mind what he was going to do and how he was going to be able to handle it. And and he, he went and he carried out his own actions. The second son was the son of a wealthy man. God is we know God is wealthy. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think he can bless us according to his riches and power and glory. God is wealthy. He is not lacking anything. Can we all agree to that? Amen. And so he was the son of a wealthy man and he took it upon himself uh, to claim his inheritance prematurely. How often have we gone out in life and we set out on things before it was our time to set out and go and do. Amen. If you uh, if you anybody here into baking or cooking anything, if you take meat off the grill or if you take cookies out the oven too early and you take them out prematurely, they won't be how they're supposed to be. As a matter of fact, the meat is raw. It is now dangerous for you. The cookie dough can disrupt what's going on on the inside of you. But the same way that we take things out too early, the son went to his father and said, I want what I want. It's mine. I, I think some people in the old church would like to say that this, the prodigal son was a millennial because they always feel like we entitled to everything. I hear that phrase entitled all the time. He went to his father and asked him for his portion so that he could go his way and enjoy his life. Amen. How often do we decide to get out of what we're supposed to do so we can have a little fun? How often do we sacrifice what we are supposed to have just so we can have some momentary fun? Hey man, you you uh, sneaking out the house when we was teenagers and uh, drinking when we weren't supposed to and sneaking up and doing things we didn't have no business so we could have just a little bit of enjoyment in our lives. Not that where we were was not fun or not that where we were was already enjoyable, but we usually always get to a place in our lives where what we are just don't seem like it's enough for us. And so now after the son has gone and he has spent all of his inheritance and he has been wasteful, he is now a product of his own actions. He is now, I said last week, he started doing broke things. Amen. He started, he didn't save the money. He didn't invest the money. He didn't sow the money. He didn't do anything right with the money. He went and what the Bible calls riotous living. Amen. He went and gambled a little bit. Is that all right? He went and got him a couple girls for some fun. He went and splurged and he went and made it rain in a couple of places. He went and he spent all of his money and he was wasteful. And he is now what we call broke. Somebody say he broke. How much better could uh, his situation have been not if he hadn't gone, not 
not if he hadn't gotten his inheritance. I'm not going to say his situation wouldn't have been better if he didn't get his inheritance. But how much better could his situation have been if he would have just stayed to gain insight as to how to use the gift that was not earned, but that was given because of his connection? How often do we abuse the gift because we are not in a place to receive instruction for our blessing? Amen. How often do we ask God for the husband, but because we didn't learn how to be a wife, we mess up the blessing that God gave us. How often have we asked God to bless us with children, but because we didn't learn how God wanted us to raise our children, did we spoil our children? Did we not love our children appropriately? How often have we asked Ask God for the new job, but because we didn't uh, pick up any type of punctuality, we found ourselves fired. How many times have we asked God for the financial blessing, but because we didn't learn how to use our money the way that God instructed us to, we found out that every time we got paid, we lost the money the same day. Anybody here ever been uh, living paycheck to paycheck? Anybody here ever uh, have gotten a little bit money and found out that uh, Friday you got paid, but Monday you didn't have no more money? Because you didn't know how to use the, the blessing that God was affording you. Come on now. And in the same manner, hallelujah. I'm getting happy. you helping me out. I'm getting happy because I understand that God is trying to get us to stay in our proper place, which is up under him. In the same manner, he waits not until his resources are low, talking about the second son, nor does he try to return to ask for more. He decides until he is completely without any help any hope and any ability to recoup that which he has lost does he begin to not reach out to his father but he reaches out to other people who couldn't even give him enough work to feed himself i just said a whole lot there we wait until we are completely out of what we need before we reach out Amen. When you see the money is going low, how, why haven't you reached out for help? Why is it that we got to come to God broke, busted, and disgusted? Why is it that we got to come to God when we have nothing left? Why is it that we got to come to God when we are at our wits end? You knew that the money was running out. You knew that the situation was in turmoil. You knew that you was arguing with your husband or your wife every other day. You knew that your child started acting up in school up for, and had been acting up for about three months. But you wait until it's about, until you in divorce court. You wait until the eviction notice comes. You wait until the, the, the shutoff notice comes before you decide to go and ask for help. And not only that, he didn't even go immediately to God. It said that he went and found a pig farmer and he went to work for him and they didn't even have enough to help him. Oh, my God. We go to people, Brother Joshua. We don't go to God and we don't ask God for help. We ask man for help. And then the immediate response to man being unable to help. It didn't say that the people refused to help. It said they were unable to help. Uh, we, we, we get to a place where, where God, not where God, when we get so hurt, we go to people and we ask people for help. And when they can't help them, we get, when they can't help us, we get mad at them. Anybody ever ask somebody for help and they said, no, nah, I can't do it. And then you got mad at them because they couldn't help you. They didn't help you get broke. They didn't help you get to the struggle. They didn't help you. They didn't help you get where you at. But now that they can't help, now you want to have an attitude with somebody. That ain't the person that you should have went to in the first place. Amen. And I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm having a good time, though. Um, his uh, uh, um, desperation, somehow, he has transitioned from entitlement to pride to desperation. He has gone from a place of daddy give me what's mine well you ain't work for none of this you ain't you ain't put in on this you went from entitlement because that's my father and i deserve what you have for me to pride in spending it all and not asking for help to now you are in a place of desperation 
Oh, man, I wish it was a scripture in the Bible that said pride come up for the fall and the haughty spirit before destruction. Amen. But uh, he's now in a desperate place. Anybody in a des- ever anybody ever been in a desperate place? You may not be desperate now, but you can relate to desperation. Is that all right? Yet his desperation is not in reconciling with his concerned father. His desperation is not uh, in trying to make it right with my parents. His desperation is not um, trying to get back connected with with the father who cared for him his whole life, um, his de- his desperation has seemed to be um, now in a place he's focused because he's hungry. <laughs> I, I'm 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 desperate to get back to my father, not because I want to make it right with my father. I'm desperate to get back with my father because I'm hungry. Amen. Uh, we we seen that a lot of times when you you hear or you see the story of Jesus and the disciples with the um, the fish and the bread. First of all, he said, "Go ahead and give them what they need," because they're not really here to hear me preach. First, they're here to eat. Is that all right? Sometimes we, well, not sometimes, a lot of times we go to God not because we want to be closer to God, but because we have a need that we need him to fulfill and meet. Is that all right? He goes, he has the mindset, he hasn't done it yet, to go back to his father because the Bible says that he was hungry. His desperation is not rooted in reconciliation. It is rooted in the fact that he is broke. It is rooted in the idea that once uh, that what was once an enjoyable life is now one of shame and disrespect and begging and all around lowliness. God, I need you because I'm broke. God, I need you to fix my marriage. God, I need you to fix my heart. God, I need you to fix my car, my house, my situation. And I'm tired of people looking at me, judging me, talking about me. I'm tired of having to ask people for a ride. So, God, I need you to come and fix my situation. Not once did he say, God, I need you to come fix what we had going on. He said, God, I need you to fix my situation. That's what his mind was initially at. It does change. Um, It is just like us who only desire to come to God in times of our greatest needs and sorrows and not seek to be restored, but seek to be replenished. Amen. We don't seek God initially for restoration. We seek God for replenishment. I lost somebody and now I need somebody to replace that person. Whether or not you, you, you say it out of your mouth, we know that there are some relationships and people that we cannot replace, but we try our best to replace them in some form of fashion. Amen. And so what we are looking at and what we have here, this is our love. This is man's love in an unreformed state. Our love. This is our raw love that hasn't been trained, that hasn't been taught, that hasn't been understood, that hasn't been grown or developed or mature. Yet it is met by God's love. Now we're on a different type of love. Now we are here dealing with God's love. And everybody know that God's love ain't our love. His thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. He doesn't operate the way that we operate. He doesn't love the way that we do. As a matter of fact, it is his love that we should ascribe to love like. Amen. The parable goes on to explain how finally when the son has come to himself, uh, I, 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 um, what were we watching? We were watching, um, Queen Sugar and, uh, the auntie said something to the, the niece and she was talking and the auntie just got real, she just got real tight with her. And she said, I don't know what you going through, but you need to come to yourself. And me and Allison, we just bust out laughing because we, neither one of us had heard the other ever heard that phrase before so we thought it was just something that they said down south like that's just one of them good old but then i was reading as i was studying i was like look it said he came to himself and so i was and i had now a new understanding of what come to yourself means when you come to yourself you begin to uh do an internal report of why you're doing what you're doing when you come to yourself you check yourself when you come to yourself you repent of the evil that you were thinking and the evil that you were doing is that all right and so um he said the bible says that the son came to himself in other words he came to his senses and he is sitting in the understanding that uh, i know who my father is and i know that there are those who serve him and they are never lacking so why should i be 
See, now you got to have a little bit of righteous indignation going on. When you know the God that you serve and you know the God that he is, you see, the thing is, in the beginning, he, he knew a little bit. He said, God, I know, Father, I know what you got, and I want my peace. Is that all right? But he did it so that he could get out the way. And God is saying, you got to know that I am, and you got to know that you belong to me, and you got to know that you ain't got to be out here struggling the way that you are struggling, and you ain't got to be out here hurting the way that you are hurting because I am your Father. Amen. And y'all got to get with me on this morning. Um, and so why in the world he, he realized, why am I sitting out here struggling when I got the father that I have? The Bible says that he said that he would set out and to go to and go to cry out before his father. And he would make himself equal to one of the servants because he was no longer worthy. Is that all right? And so um, God's grace we I had this discussion with my wife and um, she was going, she was struggling. She had said she got to a place where she didn't feel like uh, it didn't feel like she was God's child because she had been crying out and she was struggling. And we, when we were talking, she was like, I don't feel like I deserve. And I had to stop her right there. And I said, God don't operate in what you deserve. God does not walk in whether or not you are worthy or not. Worth and deserving is something that we operate in. And so with God's grace, it does not highlight how deserving or worthy one is, yet it operates in contradiction to man's notion of worthiness. What am I trying to say? You can feel like you are worth nothing. You can feel like you are worth a lot. But God said, I don't live there. I don't live in your definition of worth. I don't live in your definition of what you deserve. Because if you got what you deserve, you'd already be dead. If you got what you would deserve, you would have already been sick. If you got what you deserve, you wouldn't even be close to the grace that I can afford you. You would get everything that you have set yourself up that's coming. Is that all right? In, uh, we, in the 12 laws of the universe you have the law of, of compensation and what that means is everything that you do everything that you put out you're gonna have some type of of of, of reaction to cause and effect is that all right everything that you do there's a consequence for whether that is a good consequence or bad consequence but God says my grace exceeds that it does not sit in what it is that you do I'm going to bless you because I love you I'm going to do for you because I care about you and because you are my child and because you are my son and because you are my daughter I will love you amen and so he um he felt the son goes to his father and um He's saying, I want to be one of the servants because I'm no longer in the place of being a son. I no longer am worth being in relation to you. I'm only worth serving you. I'm only worth being beneath or being one of the hired help. Is that all right? And so um, as he's coming and as he's coming to himself and as he's having this understanding, uh, the Bible says that, the, uh, that he kind of set up in his mind that he's going to go back. Somebody say go back. He, said he made up in his mind that he's going to do a few things. And this is what we have to do. Uh, we're trying to set ourselves up to um, be recipients of grace. See, grace exists, but you got to go after grace. Somebody say, I got to go after grace. And in order for you to be in a place where God can deal with you graciously, we got to do a couple of things. The first thing we got to do is that we have to acknowledge. We got to acknowledge a couple of things. We have to acknowledge that you are a child of God's. Second Chronicles 7 and 14 says, if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves. Somebody say, I got to be humble. I got to make myself low. I got to begin to say that I am not all of that and a bag of chips. I don't have it all figured out. I am not the answer the, the, to, to everything, and I do not have the answer to everything. And then we have to acknowledge that God has all the help that you need. Is that all right? Somebody say, God has my help you have to acknowledge that not only that he has all of the help that you need you have to acknowledge that he will in in turn receive you come on now and then number two you have to come to yourself the uh, back in second chronicles it still says if they would humble themselves and pray and they would seek my face and then they would turn from their wicked ways come on somebody say i gotta turn from my wicked ways the wicked ways are not just drinking and smoking and cussing wicked ways is you not praying wicked ways is you not 
deciphering what God's word says. Wicked ways is you trying to do everything on your own or thinking that you have the answer above what God has the answer. Wicked ways are keeping God out of your situation. You have to put down your past actions and your past behaviors. You have to put down your pride. You have to put down your shame. You have to ignore how desperate your situation is. Come to yourself means ignoring how desperate your situation is. Why is it that we got to ignore how desperate our situation is, Pastor? Because as long as you are focusing on the situation, you're not focusing on the God that is above your situation. Come on now. It says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. When you're, when you're magnifying something, you're making it bigger. You're seeing it in a bigger light. You're seeing it in a bigger sense. You can magnify something. And so when you magnify God, it minimizes your problem because God is the God of all comfort. Amen. And he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or imagine so stop looking at how desperate your situation is and look at the God who was able to pull you out of that desperate situation and then we have to finally chase down grace is that all right we have to seek after it Matthew 6 and 33 Jesus says seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you what are the things peace joy love happiness money children marriage finances all of these things that clothes and nice things we're chasing after things instead of chasing after God and when we do that we, we're positioning ourselves out of grace we're pulling ourselves out of the candidacy for love and grace because we're chasing after the things that we want and we're telling God that he ain't one of them we're chasing after who we want, and we're telling God that he is not who we want. We're chasing after situations, and we're telling God that what he has for us is not what we want. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Jesus, and these things will be added unto you. And then finally, we have to position ourselves where God can see us. So how do I position myself to where God can see us? God sees us when we pray. Hallelujah. Hebrews 4 and 16 says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find somebody say grace to help in time of need. We have to uh, let us then in confidence draw near to the throne of grace. How do you go to the throne of grace? You get down on your knees and you begin to pray. Hallelujah. Help me out here. You get down and you begin to ask God for what's going on. But before you begin to ask God what it is that you have a need for, you begin to, uh, our Father who art in heaven. Come on now. Hallowed be thy name. Come on. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me this day my daily bread and forgive me my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me and lead me not until temptation, but deliver me from all evil. See, when God sees us, it's in that deliver me. Hallelujah. He sees you when you ask him to deliver you. Somebody got to say, I need you to deliver me from my situation. Deliver me from this marriage. Deliver me from my children. Deliver me from my financial struggles. God, I need you to be able to come in and work out the situation. But he cannot see you until you call upon his name. You got to begin to call out Abba Father. You got to be able to call out the name of Jesus. You got to be able to call on the God of your salvation. You got to be able to call out the God of all of your comfort. You got to be able to call out God and say, I am not worthy, but I am here to write my relationship with you. Hallelujah. Once we are in a place where God can see us, scripture tells us what, what's going to happen. The Bible says, as the son was on his way to his father's house, it says that when he was far off, his father saw him. This is the, this is the, this is where we got to get to. God seen you. He saw him and he didn't just wait on him. 
Amen. See, we deal a lot of times with people, and when somebody, when you messed over somebody and they see you coming, they either wait until you get to them or they turn their back on you and they walk away because they don't want to deal with you no more. Or if that's not you, maybe you the person that saw somebody coming that screwed you over. What did you do? You didn't do what God did, I guarantee you. I know I didn't. The Bible says the son, the father saw him and he ran to him. God, when he sees us, he comes running after us. When he sees that we are desiring to be back with him. And he hugged him. And he kissed him. And then after the father embraced him, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And I am no longer worthy, hear that word again, to be called your son. The Bible says, but the father said to his servants, he didn't even say this to his son. He said those to those that were watching, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. God's love celebrates you even when you mess up. The moment that you decide to come back, he celebrates when you come back. But he's not angry that you left. He's hurting. We, we, we pay attention and we focus on the, the second son and how wasteful he is. But imagine what the father was feeling. This child that I raised, this son that I birthed, this, this child that I've always provided for, decided one day that he wanted what I had that he didn't work for and that I was no longer worthy to be in his life. It had to hurt, but he never got angry with him. He never cursed him. He never went after him and tried to tear him down. He simply waited. God is waiting for us to decide when we want to come back and choose him as the head of our lives again. And when you choose, the Bible says he's going to throw you a party. Anybody ever had a, a party thrown for them? You ever walked into a building and it was all about you? Whenever, when you walk back into the kingdom of God, for real, God says, we're going to celebrate you. He says he was lost and in his found. And all I heard when I read that was amazing grace. We know the song. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed. God's love is there because he created us. Brandon, Levi, come here. Avery, come here. This side. This side. This side. Right there. Come on, Maddie. Come on, Maddie. Come on, Maddie. Come on. Yep. Come on. Come on. Right here. Turn around. That's it. These are my children. They are a part of me. I am half of the duo that create, I'm a third of the duo of the, of the triplet that created them. Me and my wife. And then God blessed us with one, two, three, four. And so whatever it is that they do, they will always, I don't care where they go. I don't care how many times they decide to try to change their name. They are a part of me. They represent me and I am responsible for them. They represent me. And no matter where you go, no matter who you encounter, no matter how crazy you act, you represent God. 
He said, let us create man in our image and in our likeness. I don't care what any scientist, I don't care what anybody, any religion, any philosophy, God created us and therefore we are his. So why does he love us? Because he created us. And why does he, why does he feel responsible for us? Because we look like God and because we were made in his image and his likeness. So the why to the history of grace is because you are already his. You are a child of a king. You are the child of the king. You are princes. You are princesses. You are kings. You are queens. You are glorious in God's eyes. He just needs you to come home so he can throw you a party. Amen. Let us stand. Thank you.